Thanks, Megan. Um, I do want to thank our funders before we get started. I'd like to thank uh, the Ohio Arts Council, the voters of Cuyahoga County through Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, the Cleveland Foundation, the Gunn Foundation, the Zufo Foundation, and the David E. Davis Foundation. Thank you very much for your support, everyone. So our artists tonight, um, in the order in which they'll be presenting, are Jessica Pinsky, Cynthia Lockhart, Ron Shelton, and Char Norman. So we're gonna start with Jessica. Uh, Jessica is uh, presenting from Praxis. Um, she has an MFA from Boston University and a BFA from New York University. She is the founder and executive director of Praxis, and she'll talk to you about that a little bit. She's a practicing artist besides her day job as the executive director, and she's shown in exhibits all over Ohio, uh, Sag Harbor, New York, Boston, Massachusetts, and she also was included, and I'm going to blow our own horn for a minute here, in our last textile show called In the Details at the Artist's Archives. Her work is in the collection of Metro Health Hospital, the Widden Hospital in Everett, Massachusetts, and University Hospitals. Jessica, welcome to Zoom. Oh, thank you so much. I am so uh, pleased to be here and so excited to hear from, my, uh, from the artists that are in the ex exhibition with with me. Um, this has already been such a fabulous experience and it's just like the fun keeps going. Um, so I have um, the wonderful pleasure of talking to you guys about myself and about my work and my practice in a little bit more detail tonight. So um, first I'm just going to start by uh, showing you where I am, which is a textile art studio that I founded in 2015. Um, I also, in addition to the wonderful introduction that Mindy gave, thank you so much, Mindy. Um, I'm also a faculty member at the Cleveland Institute of Art, and I was teaching in the fiber art department in 2012 when they announced that they were going to downsize the fiber department and consolidate some of the curriculum with the sculpture department, which was going to leave the looms homeless. And I am a weaver, as you all know, and that was a very sad um, situation for me, but also kind of felt like an opportunity to make something that didn't exist before in Cleveland, but also follow a model that does exist in Cleveland, where there are so many cooperative art spaces and so many different mediums that are flourishing and creating kind of an arts community that is um, very different than any other city that I've ever seen. So um, I grew up in Akron and I had just moved back after all of these years of living on the East Coast and just felt so inspired by what was possible here in Cleveland. And so um, together with the Cleveland Institute of Art, um, they became our fiscal sponsor as we started our own nonprofit in 2014. And we opened, we're in the Waterloo Arts District in Cleveland, Ohio, which is a very, interesting, diverse, um, amazing cultural community in Cleveland, on the east side of Cleveland. And it's been, um, it sort of took my life in a completely different or sort of changed direction where I was really invested in a, in a path of academia and studio practice. And now I am, um, I've been totally changed mind, body, and soul by my work in community art. And um, so it's just, it's developed myself as a person, it's changed um, the kind of, the way that I think about making art and the kinds of impacts that art can make. And it's just been the greatest honor of my life to do this. So um, I'm excited to show you just a little view. Um, I'm sitting at the back of our space, so you can see that it's a very large, um, it's about a 7,000 7, square foot room full of looms. <laughs> um, we do have a, we have a tiered membership uh, sort of um, system where people can have access to Praxis in d lots of different ways. So you can take classes and you can join as a member if you are a practicing artist. Um, we have a beautiful gallery, which I won't show you right now, but um, you should come. We have, we're doing also Zoom openings like the Artist Archives and we have one next Friday. Um, and so there's just um, a lot of different things that organization has doing. Most recently, we are fundraising for a la our last piece of digital equipment to launch a digital weaving lab, which will be a model actually unlike anything in the country where you can do residencies on uh, digital notes. 
So that's the big project of 2020. Um, so this is where I make uh, most of my work. I do have a studio at home, but it's so comfortable here and there's so much space and everything that I could ever want is here, plus all of this amazing yarn, which I don't know if you can see behind me. <laughs> um, and so the members and the staff, we all use the yarn and the materials and it's really a cooperative sharing environment. So I have to say that probably the last few years of weavings would look very different if I didn't have access to that wall behind me. So it's really an amazing material source. Um, it, and the yarn comes from all different places that have been mostly donated, or traded, or bartered, and bought. And it's a glorious uh, collection. So um, you guys saw the weavings that are at the artist archives, which the uh, bright, shiny red one. I am attracted to bright, shiny things. I, that's just a fact. And so anytime a cone of yarn comes through Praxis that has any kind of shine or glitter or gold, I just swoop it up and put it aside. And so I have um, a really beautiful palette ready for every different kind of idea that I have. Um, and I thought that I would show you guys today a little bit of like the process that I went through on that particular weaving because what I've done um, in the past, the way, the way that I've worked is that I will have an idea in my head and it will be a large idea because I do everything very large. I, I don't know um, why that's it's true though. And instead of doing like the thing that I teach my students to do, which is to draw a sketch of it first and, and maybe make a sample and then make something bigger from that sample, I never do that. I do the 10 foot weaving first. Um, no drawing, I spend hours as long as it takes uh, figuring it out in my head and then it's ready to just kind of sit down and create. Um, but with this particular series, I didn't do that. This is the first time in my life that I have started with a drawing, that I had to figure out pages and pages of math. And when, by the time I got to the loom, the math was wrong. So I had to do it over again, or really just kind of ignore it is what ended up happening. Um, and I'll show you just like, this is the very first drawing of that weaving out of Sharpies. Um, and it goes kind of more in depth in my sketchbook, lots of numbers, kind of gets a little bit more, you know, figuring out what it's really gonna take. Um, then of course, some more math, and then lots of scratched out numbers and numbers again. And, and in the end, I did end up doing kind of a final drawing, which I'm gonna show you, which is like kind of a watercolor painting of what I wanted the weaving to look like. So actually I had a really, really good idea what I wanted this particular weaving to look like. And that has, and even though that has happened before, this is, was sort of a plan and it was a really about executing this really specific idea. Um, and because we're in show and tell mode, I will just go ahead and show you the other two weavings that I've planned as part of this series, which I, if you guys came to the opening, um, you know that this particular series is about the experience of birthing um, our one-year-old twins. And so this is the first, or going to be the first weaving in the series. Um, and this um, like is pretty literal, you know, with the two babies. Um, and this is the sketch of the weaving that will complete the series, which is about the recovery of my experience. And then of course the red weaving is about the actual delivery. Um, and it's actually, it was really satisfying to have these paintings and to see something really quickly, matri you know, matriculate and be visual that I could touch. Um, and I am excited to kind of continue working that way. So the next weaving that I have planned, um, I was said, why don't I just keep going with this painting thing? Cause it's kind of working out for me. Um, so I'll show you guys that one. Um, so this is, uh, I don't know if you can see it sort of, I'm sort of backlit, okay. Um, but this is the next weaving that I have going on. And um, you can see that the background is like very multicolored and changing and transitioning. Um, and then it has that same 
pulling out of the vertical fibers and cascading as it's going down, which um, happened in the delivery weaving from the artist archives show. And that's sort of like my thing that I'm working with right now that's been this amazing technical challenge and it's giving my something, something for my brain to chew on. Um, and so this is the beginning of it right now. It's just um, oh, my warp is being measured. This is a warping board. Um, Shar has one behind her right now, so I, maybe she'll talk about it too. Um, and so I'm using silk and um, this is where I'll measure the fibers out and I'm actually gonna transition them to a table and paint them and that's how I'm going to with dye paint them with dye and that's how I'm going to get that really like flowy cascading color situation so I think that um, you know I'm actually I was just sitting here as we were logging on thinking what's next for my my work you know after these next four weavings are kind of planned out but what's the next thing and um, the idea of using the new digital equipment that Praxis is um, acquiring is very exciting and I think that it might be time for some imagery to come back into my work which has been very abstract for a long time and um, like I started as a painter and I made really um, representational paintings so the work that I made Make now is really different from where I started at the beginning of my artistic career and it couldn't feel I couldn't feel more authentic you know in making it it really feels like the work that I am meant to make but I am excited to see how some photographic imagery or figurative imagery could come back into the work with the um, accessibility of this new equipment so um, yes that's I think I have five minutes left um, so that is kind of what I have um, planned on the horizon. Um, but I think that what's kind of linked the work that I'm making now to the work that I've always made is my love and appreciation of all things color. Um, and definitely wanting to build up a weaving the way that I can build up a painting. Like I learned so much from my education about color and painting and transparency and viscosity and all of these amazing things. And I actually feel like for me, um, textiles is a way to organize that information. Um, I love the fact that with weaving, you are working with a horizontal and a vertical axis. axis. However, you can begin to manipulate that rule in such a dramatic way and all of a sudden you're creating sculpture, you're creating installation, you're creating video, you know, the, the, um, the possibilities are endless. And I also, um, conceptually, um, I feel very connected to textiles. And um, I think partially it's like a familial history. Um, my, my grandmother, my great grandmother was a tailor, um, an immigrant from Poland and uh, was a dressmaker tailor. And that sort of carried on, I think, some sort of psych psychologically down to me. Um, so I'm, I love that connection that I have with my family, but I also love the greater cultural connection because textiles link us all humans together because we're using them and we're sleeping in them and they're dressing us and they're part of every ceremony that we've ever had as a civilization. Um, so there's just so much power in that and I like big, bold, powerful things. So it makes sense. And um, I, and so I, when I started making weavings, I think it was the first time in my life that I felt like I was really making something that felt right and felt like me. Um, so I, um, so I think that's it. I think Kelly, you just asked if you wanted to share the red piece. We should end with that maybe. Um, and uh, you guys can see again, like the piece in its final state that is hanging as part of the Art and Thread show. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great idea, Kelly. Cool. Yeah, and I think I'll just like, t another technical thing, um, you know, one of the things that I was really playing with was trying to make is trying to make the material behave in a certain way. And certain types of fibers are, um, you know, have inherent qualities. So I was using nylon and I wanted it to cascade, you can see in that first tier, very organized. And as it continues to cascade down to the gold at the bottom, I wanted it to be more twisted, more uneven, more chaos. 
So um, it's just been fun for me as a weaver to kind of figure out how to work with the inherent nature of all of these fibers and put them together and make them melt with the vision that um, I start with. So this was a real um, pleasure to see this one come out. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to show it. Thanks, Jessica. That was amazing. I, I, it's great seeing Praxis. I love it. And um, hearing about your work and kind of, um, I have to say those little paintings that you do are absolutely beautiful. Thank um, you. That you're doing is, um, yeah. I'm so excited wonderful. about them. I'll have to keep making them. <laughs> yes, yes. And maybe you'll be showing those separately because I think they're, they're definitely good enough. Yeah. Great. So um, our next artist up is Cynthia Lockhart. Um, Cynthia is coming to us from Cincinnati. She's a University of Cincinnati Emerita professor. She has a Bachelor of Science in Fashion Design and Fashion Accessories, which is kind of her background. And when she lived in New York City um, in the 80s, her clients included major stores, Neiman Marcus, Saks, Macy's, Bendel's, uh, Barney's, and more. Um, so besides teaching classes and workshops and exhibiting her work all over the world, um, including countries like South Africa, Korea, Japan, and across the United States. Um, she recently had a show at the Taft Museum of Art, and I think she's going to tell us a little bit about that. Um, her work has been commissioned for the University of Cincinnati, the Cincinnati New Children's Hospital, NAACP, Cincinnati Art Museum, and is in over 27 different public and private collections. Uh, there's probably more too, but that's you know, that's all she gave me on her resume, which is as tall as I am, and I'm pretty tall. So it was, uh, yeah, very, very hefty. Um, so Cynthia, welcome, and um, please, we're ready. Okay. I'm getting used to Zoomer Zoomer, everybody. Okay. But anyway, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so pleased and so excited to be a part of this project to be invited by Tony Williams, our, our curator, and our, our lovely Mindy, Megan, and Kelly for being such great hosts just uh, through this whole endeavor. Uh, uh, dear, dear to my heart is uh, The Journey of Freedom, which is a show that I was invited to do uh, last year. And uh, you're going to see a clip of it because it, I was filmed uh, by the, the art show and I thought I was only being filmed to do uh, some clips during Black History Month. And I said, oh, this is, I was excited about that. And then about uh, two months ago, I got an email uh, saying, Cynthia, your, your clip, your show is ready. So we're gonna show you a little clip of the show because it really captures the essence of a, a full uh, show for me. Uh, and it gave me an opportunity to tell the story about Journey to Freedom, of uh, my, my ancestors who came over uh, 401 years ago, um, and they br were brought over to this country, and uh, ultimately we became a vibrant and a creative part of this dynamic America. And African Americans, we are Americans. But just want you to see that first and, uh, and uh, enjoy that. Okay. Can we, if we don't, we don't hear video, Kelly, we don't hear video. Okay, hold on. Okay, okay we're going to try to do this. It's the magic of Zoom, everybody. It works Absolutely. perfectly. Like Absolutely. Like <laughs> it's so, practice. Hold on. It is showing you imagery of the pieces uh, right now. And this is a close up of one of my pieces, which I built a totem. 
and the totem was to honor my ancestors and to, to celebrate inspiration that I derived from my ancestors. Wow. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know why the sound's not coming through. That's okay. So this is me at the totem, kind of, kind of adjusting. This was actually filmed as the show was being hung. And so you're seeing various aspects of it to, to the left or right there is, is, is a piece called Jazz. And uh, you can play the browse from the browser and let it pick up. That is uh, called Journey to Freedom and that depicts two slaves who are running to freedom, two ordinary people, um, not like the folks that we hear about all the time, but the everyday person that decided to just have the strength and courage to leave and, and, and flee. This is me working on a wall piece that I uh, dyed and um, hand painted to go as, as a backdrop to the totem that I did. Looks like it might be going a little fast too. We could probably share a link with you to this and you could in, enjoy it, but silent pictures were once quite good. And um, so we can use our imagination. Again, me adjusting on one of the Pharaoh's faces. And um, that is a, a piece that I have done. Uh, that was a, um, a piece that I did many, many years ago that was shown in a, um, a show with Dr. Carolyn Maslumi uh, in New York. And I, I used essence of cotton. I used, I created orbs to represent um, people who no, are no longer here, but they're from our spirit and our hope. And I represent them in uh, circles and orbs. And in each orb, I will put a prayer. Uh, this is the meandering and the journey the flow of life, which I try to depict in my artwork. And that, that is a framework for my artwork. Uh, this is a, 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 the Duncanson, uh, Duncanson artist. Robert Duncanson was the first African-American artist that was hired and became renowned because of his affiliation uh, with, uh, with the Taft home. Uh, the family that hired him were abolitionists. So it was quite scandalous that they had an African-American man who was actually painting the entryway of, of their home. Here's one of his luscious paintings with a patina look and he did a Trump Loy border on his work. That's why I was so attracted by it. Um, oftentimes I try to play tricks with my artwork and I saw that uh, Duncan said did that quite well. And so that's why I was inspired uh, to use uh, inspiration from his work in some pieces that I made specifically for the Taft. This is me. Uh, trying to articulate uh, how, how I feel about uh, Duncanson's work, how special it was for me um, to study his pieces and then uh, be able to reflect on it and to create that one piece that I did, which was called A Runaway uh, Slave, Swing Low Sweet Chariot. And if, if we actually, this one's called Created to Be Me. And it just shows you some of my, my work that I use, my processes, I dye, I applique, um, paint, uh, create the patterns. Uh, my background is fashion design. So I, I am able to, to make phenomenal patterns. Anything that can be made, I can make. Anything I can think, I can make it uh, from, from my fashion design skills. And uh, it has it's been just a wonderful opportunity to still be able to touch cloth, to touch fiber, and to uh, translate it into art forms, uh, not just wearables. And again, Swing Low Sweet uh, Chariot is a, a piece that I, that I created for Taft, uh, being inspired by Duncanson's uh, murals. Okay. And maybe we can provide the link for them, Kelly. Yes. Yeah, so they can hear, hear the story. So that one is Swing Low Sweet Chariot, and it depicts a uh, slave in the middle running, and then there's three um, slaves over his shoulder and those in my imagination those three slaves are singing Swing Low Sweet Chariot and in that song Sweet Low Sweet Chariot is a uh, directions of where to go uh, what where your, your navigation to be safe and it uh, the song led you to uh, the code in the song led you to where you needed to be and that piece Cynthia is at the Arden Thread, that's at the yes, Arden Thank you, thank yes. you, Kelly. This one is actually uh, in the gallery. 
You see my silk screening in the back to uh, mimic the African uh, iconography. And then here's an orb that is being shown as well. Would you like me to stop it? Yes. Okay. At this particular time. Great. Thank you. I will put the I, link. Sorry right. about that. Thank you. Hopefully everyone was able to see that. If not, you'll, you'll look at the uh, 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 video and it's, it's quite spectacular. So now we are just going to talk about my, my, are we going to show the, the other one? You tell me when. Why don't I just talk a little bit about my, my background. My, okay. my background, my undergrad is fashion design. I had the uh, a privilege of uh, uh, going to University of Cincinnati where they had a co-op program. One of the, the main reasons why, well, first I wanted to go to Paris. You know, your parents are like, where do you want to go? I want to go to Paris to school. And they said, okay. Why don't you, you know, apply to some other places? I applied to other places. I applied to University of Cincinnati, and I got a scholarship there. And so the uh, idea of going to Paris it could not exist anymore once you got a scholarship to, to go uh, to the University of Cincinnati. Um, uh, there I have uh, studied the fashion design in the fashion design program, and I participated in the co-op program, which took me around the world. So that was my um, agreement. I, I was able to travel. Every other uh, semester, start out with quarters, but now every other semester, students are able to work in school, uh, create in school, and also go and work in the industry. So that's what I did for many years. That was my undergrad uh, position. Um, also, one of the big, big influences in my life is my mother. Uh, my mother, who is no longer uh, with us, with us, but she's with us in spirit, was a phenomenal woman who uh, practiced upholstery. She she practiced making uh, drapery. She, she practiced uh, uh, making clothing. And also she modeled. So my sister and I, she took us everywhere. She trained us. I was at her beck and call. And that's where I got my love for the art and thread for, for my mother, who was, who was uh, absolutely spectacular. Um, uh, with, with that said, this uh, transition, um, I went to New York for many years after I graduated from the University of Cincinnati. Um, to to find to find myself as a as a designer, and I worked in the fashion industry there for approximately uh, twelve years. Had a, a wonderful career uh, designing garments and designing handbags, and then ultimately went into my own business. So these various uh, skills of um, survival. When you're, in, when you're in New York and you're from Cincinnati, Ohio, you have to learn how to survive. And oh yes, when you're an artist. You have to learn how to survive um, because um, uh, art, art is, is, is something that you just have to be madly, ardently in love with um, uh, to appreciate. It, it, is, it is something very special. Artists are very special. The opportunity to be able to create art is a, a very a special uh, accomplishment. But um, my journey now does include uh, making these uh, phenomenal quilts and they are really a part of my heart and my soul. And also I borrow stories and I'm inspired by uh, people and their, their, their travels and how they live their lives. And, 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 I, and I try to create an ambiance of, of a hope and of a spirit in, in, in my cloth. So you've, you've heard of the spirit and the cloth. That's what I try to do. I try to communicate through my art, um, through my, my fabrications and, and nothing uh, nothing is off limits. I will use nails. I will use crystals. I'll use Swarovski. I'll use wood. So I'm literally building that story. So wow, we could even have a, a TV show and you could give me a, a bag of trash and I could come up with something uh, that provocative um, that I believe somebody would say, I see something in that. So that's how I feel about um, uh, art. I did have the opportunity to teach while I was at University of Cincinnati. And for many years, I taught in the co-op program, which was supporting my fashion design students and product development students in, the, uh, in their professional credentialing. So I was responsible for having the industry partners come in, reviewing their portfolios and what have you. So while I was doing that, I was, I was pursuing my art career while I was at school teaching. And so there came a point in time when um, I had enough nerve to talk to um, um, uh, my head of my department and to the dean of the dean of DAP, and I said, "You know what? 
I should be in DAP teaching. That's something that I've wanted to do for years because for years I told my students, go for your dream. Don't be fearful of anything. Pursue what you need to pursue. Therefore, I pursued that and they both said, okay, we'll, we'll get back with you. And in a couple of months, they got back with me and said, guess what, Cynthia, you'll be teaching in DAP. So that is one of the uh, uh, God stories in my life because I prayed for it. It was not something that just uh, came because I thought it was going to happen. I prayed for it to happen. So again, um, symbols in my life is my faith is very important to me. Family, uh, friends, humanity is important for me. Humanity, people of all races, of all colors, of all countries. I, I believe we are one human family and we should begin to act like it. And then perhaps maybe that pandemic might flee from us. That's what I feel. That's what I feel. I don't know how much time I have right now. I do have one, one more piece of art that's not going to jump around. <laughs> and it talks about my aesthetic. This is um, a dance of hope. So this is a, a piece of art that at one point in time, we had this protagonist that's off to your, probably your uh, a left, and um, the thin shape. And, and that piece of art was attached to this other side. And because this, this piece of art wanted to break free and break loose and, and had the hope and the aspiration, that, that, that piece of dancing, dancing piece just danced right off and split off from that other piece. So again, my, I was told by another artist in this show that her, her work speaks to her. Oh, my work speaks to me and my work actually tells me what to do also. So I knew it, it started off as being one strong piece, but this piece of uh, um, artwork off to, to the left there had to separate and had to jump free to become themselves. Where am I now? Well, you still have a couple minutes if you want. Okay. Um, we okay. can go. Um, I would also uh, just, just like to say that this is probably one of the most important um, times in our lives because we have never been, I don't believe any of us have been in a pandemic before. I, I don't believe any of us have um, experienced the amount of uh, love and pain and anguish that happens when a loved one dies of a COVID or the, the extraordinary time that we're in when we have people in America of all races, of, of all types, walks of life, of people are getting together and just saying that we need to change and we need to make something happen for the positive. So whatever you do right now, dream, be inspired. Don't let anything hold you back from what you need to do. Take advantage of what looks like you're in a dark box, Oh, I'm going to tell you the light is right over the corner. It's right. The sun is coming up. The stars will be in the sky. So don't let this hold you back from anything that you desire to do. Just reach for the stars. Dance with your hope. Open yourself up as wide as you can now, and the universe will receive you. I think we got to end at that one. That's, that's amazing. You know, every time I hear Cynthia speak, um, I, I'm uplifted and I, I come away feeling, um, just really uplifted. Yeah. That was, that was amazing, Cynthia. And you, you. please do come visit the show and see her work in person. Um, it is masterful and, um, the scale of it is also really important. Um, something about this show is, um, the scale differences in some of the artwork, I think is very, very important to the different pieces. We have pieces that are small and precious, and then we have pieces like Cynthia's, which are, you know, take up the wall. Um, so thank you so much. That was thank amazing. You. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce our next artist, who is Ron Shelton. Um, Ron, interestingly enough, has a degree in cinematography from the Ohio State University. We'll have to talk about that, Ron. I thought that was, that was pretty interesting that you, you have that degree, but you're a textile artist. Um, he has expressed that he's had a passion for textile art since a very early age. So I guess you must have gone back to it at some point. Um, he's a multimedia artist, as you'll see, and a hat designer. And that's really important too. So I know he's gonna talk to you about that. And I will say that he started High Art Fridays which is a nonprofit online arts magazine. 
It began in 2013 and it's grown into a global art network of international artists with the membership of 1800. This is amazing. This man is in Cleveland, you guys, and he's doing this. Um, we have a great art scene here. So uh, alongside with running High Art Fridays, he continues to create award-winning work and he shows it not just here in Ohio, but all over the world, including Ankara, Turkey, Rotterdam in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Italy. And um, so besides the what's up from him in the Artist Archives and the Art and Thread, I know he's got some things coming up locally and I wanna make sure that he tells you about them too as he talks about his work. And um, I think also, you know, hopefully he's gonna talk about why his work is in plastic, which is very unusual. Um, so Ron, we're so excited to see your studio. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you, Mindy. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Tony, for curating the show. Thanks to Kelly and Megan. Uh, my name is Ron Shelton. I'm a multimedia artist. I currently live in Lakewood, Ohio, originally from Columbus, Ohio. I did my undergraduate work at Ohio State. As Mindy mentioned, I have a BA in cinematography, which was actually a sort of a short-lived project. I was able to work at a local a news station. Uh, I, I did a senior film project, but that was pretty much the extent of my film career. It didn't really blossom to the point that I had hoped to. So I have been dabbling in many different mediums over the past 20, so, 20 or so plus years. The most uh, focus of the mediums that I worked in has been a hat designer. I've been a hat designer for the past 20 years. I've, I've been trained in traditional men's hats. Uh, I've been trained in the millinery arts. Um, and the, one of the most pivotal things in, in my life, uh, as Mindy mentioned, in 2013, I started a Facebook group called High Art Fridays. Every Friday, I would peruse Pinterest and gather really unique, nonlinear works, abstract works, and post them every Friday. So every Friday, it, it began to get more popular. People started joining the group, and that's, it became, became known as High Art Fridays. So we became a, a nonprofit in 2016. Um, and we have an amazing collection of artists. These artists, one thing I noticed about several artists, especially artists living in coastal regions, they were using plastics as a medium. And they were making an, an aesthetic statement uh, joined with a very political and environmental statement about the damages that plastics is doing, particularly like uh, developing countries, namely Ghana and El Salvador, were two of my primary uh, members, uh, Patrick Clarkson, they live both, both in Antonio Minia of, of El Salvador, they live in coastal regions, and their beaches were overwrought, overwhelmed by plastics, specifically plastic flip-flops. So both of these artists, you know, began creating these masterful pieces of artwork made from flip-flops. And also, in, in, in addition to those two, Taeyeon Kim from South Korea, um, Cynthia Manet from at Los Angeles, those four individuals basically were my muses. They sort of got me thinking about plastics and I sort of sort of altered the medium that I was currently working in, which was actually ephemeral medium. I was working with chalk on slate and actually ice. I'm very passionate about the winters. I, I run in the winters. I create installation, I, ice uh, installation during the winter. And I became sort of disappointed because of the winters in Cleveland is becoming less and less uh, cold, less and less snowy. So that was has been a sort of a deterrent. So when I began to like look at plastics, I started my own personal campaign of plastic hoarding. I held onto every article of plastic for, for months. And when I began to see the amount of plastics that one person generates, it just, it changed my life. It, it made me sort of melancholy about the, the state of the environment, and it, it really allowed me to grasp where we are in, in our plastic consumption. It made me look at hyper consumerism, consumerism, how our culture is entrenched in consumerism, and it just sort of shifted my dynamics. So I began exhibiting large scale installation pieces. I've exhibited uh, several years at Firefish, uh, Room Select. And most recently, Can Triennial, which actually one of my installations is still on display at Can Triennial. 
Um, I actually recently um, received a couple of grants. We rec recently received a grant from the Sigma Foundation to promote a project which we call HAF Connects. It's a project connecting international artists who are working in plastics to addressing the same environmental platform. And so the, the, the common phrase that, that comes to mind is think globally, act locally, and that's what this project is doing. Uh, and actually I submitted a grant application to the Ohio Art Council as well. And I learned last week that I was approved for a, a grant for that project to continue this project. So it is my goal to like develop this project and continue it and you know expanding it to different different corners of the earth, you know, to developing it, bringing awareness to the dangers of plastics. And ironically, this whole uh, cone project, which started at my, um, I did a 10 week art residency at Art House. I was working with third graders and we constructed these uh, wire frame structures and we embellished them with plastics. This is, that, that was sort of the catalyst that started this whole movement that's grown into an international campaign. Um, so right now we have collected cones from, from Ghana, uh, South Korea, El Salvador, Los Angeles. And we have seven artists in Northeast Ohio that are participating in this project. I have recently also joined forces with Sustainable Cleveland, uh, Kathy Lane. She's like sort of taking me under on her arms. She's really interested in my project and we are going to be doing some workshopping with Sustainable Cleveland and, uh, and Upcycle, uh, Recycle Shop. Um, so that's really, really exciting. I, I think this is a very, very important time. And we all know the pandemic has sort of shifted our usage of plastic. You know, we were making a lot of headway with plastic reform. You know, Cleveland proposed a plastic ban ban as, as a lot of other countries and, 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 and cultures have done that. But with this onset of the pandemic, the plastic industry, there's a letter from Plastic Industries Association, which is dated March 18th. They addressed, they addressed uh, the United States Department of Health and Human Services in DC, making a claim that, that plastics is good for the pandemic. Plastics, you know, will help sterilize and keep us safe. And as a result of that, many local um, principalities have, you know, outlaw bringing in usable bags to, you know, to, which we all know we can't bring our bags to the stores. So plastics, the plastic industry was behind that whole movement of removing, you know, uh, takeout bags, paper bags from grocery stores. So it's, it's like creating monopoly. Um, in the year 2025, the plastic manufacturing is going to be doubled as to what it is today. And actually, President Trump uh, initiated a, a, a collaborative effort with Exxon in Saudi Arabia. They're going to be creating the largest plastic manufacturing uh, facility in the world. So plastic is is not slowing down. It's, it's increasing, and it's, it is my duty. I feel like I, I just sort of taken on this task, you know. And I, my apartment, my studio is is overwhelmed with plastics because this is an important issue, and I and we need to like really think about our 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 culture and how we promote this by our hyper consumer hyper-consumer uh, nature. So I'm gonna take you through a brief uh, little studio tour of my work and show you some of the works that other artists are doing. Um, these cones are from the artists in my project. Uh, there's the cone from, this is from South Korea. This is from Cleveland. Cleveland, this cone is from Ghana. This is from Ghana. And this is actually my, my personal latest piece which is actually made of melted uh, medicine bottles. There's just an overwhelming amount of plastics everywhere. And these here are two more of the jackets, uh, the robes that I'm actually currently working on. I have a show coming up at the Halle uh, building next month. I was one of the winning recipients of the Downtown Cleveland Alliance art competition. Uh, I'm gonna take you, the hat. one thing about my work, hats has always been a product of my work. And this here is some of the hats that I have created over the over the over the years. I've created a variety of mediums, woven wire, hand felted merino wool, leather, branches. There's a variety of mediums in this collection. It sort of inspired me to do the project that I'm doing now. So that's, I don't really have a whole bunch more to say. That's pretty much it for me. Um, thank you for looking at my work.
and that's it. Oh, Ron, can you show us that other wall of hats that oh, you okay, showed us okay, earlier too? Okay. Yeah, this project, the international community has really been really it's inspirational for me. By developing High Art Fridays, it has opened up my international, I've exhibited internationally, I've gone to Italy a couple times, and this wall here is a collection of hats. It's a High Art Friday art cap exchange project. I actually created the, the base straw cap, and I uh, ship these blank caps to artists all over the world. They embellish them with their material, and I, in turn, create a hat and ship it back to them. This particular hat here is from Ireland. The hat here is from the Netherlands. Uh, there's hats from France, from Ghana, from Japan, from Korea. It's just an amazing inspiration, and it sort of brings cultures together. That's sort of the main purpose of what High Art Fridays does. It's bringing us together as, as, as a culture, you know, thinking globally, acting locally. That's sort of been a, a sort of a phrase that I've sort of adapted. Can you show us um, some of the uh, forms that you use to make the hats, too? I thought those were really interesting. Uh, forms? Well. Yeah, you had some like wooden forms that you, you said were vintage. Oh, yeah, OK. And these are some of the blocks. Traditional hats are made are for, from hat blocks. And these are some of my block collection. I've been collecting hat blocks for many years. Some of these are very, very old very unique, uh, like one-of-a-kind shapes, and these are actually what hats are made from. Yep, so that's it. Thanks, Ron. I had okay. a question real quick when I, you were showing us your jackets. Do you okay. have footprints on one of those jackets? Are I do have footprints, ones? yes. This okay. one, is footprints. Yeah, okay. I love that. And these jackets will go in the Holly building next month. Um, so the Holly building, are they going to be like in the lobby of the building or is there a gallery in there? I think they're, the, the image that I saw was like a, a lobby. It's going to be basically virtual. They're really not sure how they're going to work it out because of the pandemic. But it's going to be sort of a virtually, uh, sort of on a virtual platform. Okay, cool. I look forward to seeing that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in the in the Art and Thread show, if you haven't been there yet, Ron has three jackets and three hats, which are suspended over the jackets. So you can't try them on. But um, <laughs> but they, you know, maybe at the end of the show, I'm going to try one on, Ron, with you standing there, so I don't ruin it. But they're they're right. pretty cool. Um, I love them. So um, we're going to go to our next artist, who is Char Norman. Um, Char has a BA in studio art from Scripps College and an MFA from Claremont University. So she went to California for her school. Um, maybe you'll tell us if you were from California originally. Don't know. Um, she uh, teaches, I think she teaches at the faculty of Columbus College of Art and Design. Um, I, I would assume because she's curated some faculty shows for them. Um, she's shown in lots of universities and colleges all over the country, Mesa, Arizona, Wichita, Kansas, all over Ohio, including the um, OAC Rife Gallery and the Zanesville Museum. And from 2018 to 21, she curated nine exhibitions, including two at the Studio Art Centers International in Florence, Italy. And um, she also likes to make a statement in her work about the environment, um, about the environmental crisis and the symbiotic relationship between humans that we have or we should have with nature anyway. And um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Shar. She's in her studio, which is great. And we're gonna we'll, and just uh, sorry, real quick, Mindy, uh, real, just to remind everyone that if you have questions for any of the artists to go ahead and use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And then when all the presentations are done, we'll ask them. It's a really fun part of Zoom. So thanks so much, let me mute myself and take yeah, and a reminder when you are asking questions, if they're for a specific artist, just put the artist's name in there. If it's for Ron or if it's for Cynthia or for Char, just put it in there that we know, so we know who to ask it to. Otherwise, it's general, and we'll ask all the artists, and they can all answer. Thanks. Okay. Hi, everybody. 
this is um, such a pleasure to be here. Um, so I am from Southern California originally. Um, I lived most of my life there until I came to Columbus, Ohio. So that's a great influence on me. Um, and then, uh, you know, as, as was stated, I went to uh, Scripps College and uh, studied liberal arts, but with a major in fine arts. And my emphasis was in uh, weaving, textile arts. And then I went on to San Diego State for a while and did a master's, um, never finished that, but then went on to graduate school to get my MFA at Claremont Graduate University, which is also part of the Claremont Colleges where Scripps is. So that's been a big influence. But growing up in California, and I, I was started out really uh, in the Bay Area in San Francisco, and my family moved progressively south. So I have a lot of different influences that are coming from California. And my family were campers. Um, a lot of that, I think, was because that's how we could afford vacations. But tremendous influence on my life. Um, and with my two brothers, I was always exploring and out in nature and doing different things. And I really consider myself uh, an environmental artist as well as a fiber artist. So, you know, that's, I think, what brings me to what I'm doing today. And as far as um, my career path goes, I was, after college, I moved to um, Columbus, Ohio, and we came here for job. My husband was actually hired to teach at Columbus College of Art and Design, and I was an independent contractor. I worked uh, in community arts, uh, setting up programs, teaching uh, in different venues all over the, well, actually all over the state. And I taught uh, children's art um, all the way up to graduate school. So that was a big part of uh, what I've done too. But then I went, I was hired by Columbus College of Art and Design to develop their continuing education program. And I kind of worked my way up the ladder there. I was never really full-time faculty there, but I was associate provost and eventually dean of faculty. So I have a lot of interaction with faculty which is why I curated so many faculty shows. And uh, part of that, you know, I was working a pretty intense job at CCAD, um, but I felt that I had to be an example for faculty. Uh, so I, I showed all the time and I kept up my studio practice and then uh, I retired from there oh in 2013 so it's been a while and i've been a full-time studio artist ever since uh, but what i want to do is talk to you more about environmental things um, as i said i grew up hiking uh in the forests uh, the redwood forests all the way to the coast and then when i moved to san diego it was the beaches and tide pools and just exploring all kinds of wonderful things so that has ended up in my art. Now, when I was in college, uh, as I said, I, I, my emphasis was in fibers, um, but I had a minor in printmaking. So I was always working with paper, which has led to my paper making that I do now. And always kind of attempting to get the two things together. Um, so in college, I was printing on my weavings, I was sewing on my prints, and just, you know, an effort to do that. Um, so I'm going to, what I want to do really is walk you through my studio and show you what I do and all the things I collect here. So I'm going to turn my camera around so you can see. I think that works. And um, I've got my thumb over the camera. That's not so great. Um, so let's see. I'll give you kind of an overview of, I don't know what's happening here with my camera. Okay, there we go. Okay, that looks good. Uh, that looks good? Okay, good. I'm gonna try to do this without making you dizzy. So I'm gonna walk slow. Thank and you. try not to trip over my feet. But I'm going to start over here because my work, even though it's sculptural, it starts on the loom. 
and I have this affinity for threads and fibers and fabric and that comes I think because when I was a child my mother did a lot of sewing and my grandmother did a lot of knitting and I always had little bits of yarn and pieces of fabric that I could play with and and do things and just kind of create my own thing and figure out how to sew and how to put things together and that I think I think led to my love of fiber. Um, my education was pretty traditional as far as, you know, painting, drawing, printmaking, you know, all the normal things, but it's always been fiber that's really captured me. So I have quite a large collection of things, uh, fibers and, you know, different kinds of things that I work with. Um, this particular loom is the one I use most, and it's just a little four harness. You can see there's a weaving started on here. Um, as I said, things start on the loom. So I'm working flat at first, and then engineering it into a 3D design. If you look at this, these are spacers that I put in as I'm weaving, and I'm not gonna show you in a little bit how I manipulate those. Uh, but the actual weaving is this in here, and this will become one of my sculptures. So that's a smaller loom. Um, as I move around here, I've got larger looms. So depending on what size the sculpture is going to be, that will be the loom that I choose to use. Um, this particular one is set up for it's, I'm just starting, but it's a project that I've been commissioned to do, which will be outdoors, which is kind of a fun thing. Um, usually my work is in galleries and that sort of thing. Uh, I've got little table looms. I've got all kinds of things that I do. This is the color palette that this particular piece is going to be because it's going to be installed in a tree uh, and reflect the landscape where it's going to be. It'll be along the Scioto River. Um, spinning wheel i do spin some of my own fibers mostly i purchase commercial fibers i use linen primarily uh, but i do spin like banana fiber and things like that um, so uh so move around you can see there's just i i consider my studio organized chaos because that's truly what it is <laughs> uh, so I'm a pretty organized person, but I have a lot of stuff. Um, this is my big work table. I wanna show you this sculpture. Uh, this is, it's about the um, ice caps melting. So let me see if I can get the whole thing in here. Um, yeah, so it's, you'll see this pod shape in almost all of my work that's kind of ubiquitous in my work. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that and how I do that. But uh, this particular piece, as I said, I want to address climate change. So I wanted to give that impression of the melting. So this is just fiber that I spun and didn't spin, you know, so it's raw in some cases. Um, this is a piece I'm working on. And it's got nine sections on it. I want to show you a close up here. These are roses that are from a bouquet that just dried out. And I thought, oh, those are really beautiful. So I waxed them uh, to preserve them. And the piece itself has nine pieces in it. Uh, I call it Novena, I'm sorry, Novena, because it's uh, nine prayers for the universe. And that will be a wall piece. Not all of my work is on pedestals. I do quite a few wall pieces as well. Um, I'm gonna walk over here. I do a lot of paper making. This is kind of where I do my paper. Um, I uh, have to be, because I have a small space to do paper, not a big studio, uh, I you know, keep it pretty organized. And I have to put it all away when I wanna do something else. I have a lot of storage here in my studio. This is uh, an installation piece I did, which was actually at the Rife Center last year, and it's called Ghost Forest. And this addresses the emerald ash borer. Uh, as you know, the ash borer came through 
and destroyed all of our ash trees. Well, when the tree dies, the bark just kind of sheds, it peels off in these big, beautiful pieces. So I would go and collect them. I live right by a park, um, which is actually a nature preserve, and you're not supposed to take anything, but I live only two blocks away, so I didn't think I was uh, importing ash borer anywhere. So I'd go in about five in the morning and I'd drag out these big pieces of bark, bring them to my studio, and then um, complete the tree itself by making handmade paper that kind of reflects shelf mold, but also completes the shape of the tree. And the idea here was to really talk about consumerism because the ash borer came in from China, from crates, from all the stuff that we buy that we don't need. <laughs> so it's kind of a comment on consumerism. Um, this last year, one thing I wanted to say about working at CCAD is one of my jobs was to do all the international education. So I traveled extensively kind of all over the world. And that has been a tremendous influence on my work. Uh, and I continue to travel, not now, of course. Now I'm at home, isolated like all of us. Uh, but, you know, just seeing different things in the world has been amazing. And recently, last year, this is after I retired, but I got an opportunity to travel to Ecuador and I traveled with a very good friend and buddy of mine, Helen Hoffelt, who's also an amazing artist. And she and I just collected so many ideas and so many things um, there. And I was really, really interested in these plants, uh, these palm trees, They're, and the seeds that they produce. And they're called, um, I'm gonna show you. This little seed in here is called a tagua seed. And it's also known as vegetable ivory in that it can be carved like ivory, it looks like ivory, and it replaces real ivory. So it's really a sustainable thing. And that was just so exciting to me. Um, so I created quite a few pieces around that. Uh, here's another one. And you can see that tagua here and then these pod shapes kind of referencing them these pods to me become almost like shrines so i often will put natural things in it here's another little one with the tagua seed um, the other thing that fascinated me about Ecuador and the Amazon rainforest were these birds. They're called Orinpendula, and they're weaver birds. And they make these amazing nests that are this shape, uh, and their song is incredible. So I wanted to use those kind of as a metaphor for the destruction of the rainforest, where the bottom is breaking out, and in the real nest, um, they, the mother bird creates this and she puts one egg in it and it's to protect the egg from spiders and snakes and things. But in this one, things are leaking out and these are the colors of Ecuador. So this is a statement on the destruction of the rainforest. And then I'm doing a whole installation. First of all, you can see here, I've got just bark and sticks and things everywhere um, but here's my tagua I'm gonna back up so you can see this this is a big installation uh, getting ready for a couple of shows that Helen and I are doing on the Amazon and these will hang from the ceiling and again it's a conversation about the destruction of the rainforest using these nests as the metaphor um, and as I get closer you can see these are um, they're made from kozo which is a plant used in paper making um, and I cook it and it becomes very pliable and you can pull it apart and make these lacy forms with it uh, it's very, very strong. Um, so I like that and I like the shape because it references those birds. This part 
is uh, knitted. So I had to go back and relearn to knit so that I could do that. So that's going to be shown at Ohio Dominican University and then also at the Columbus Cultural Arts Center. Uh, those shows have been pushed into the future, so not quite yet, uh, but we're preparing. And then these are my supplies. As you can see, I pick up rocks and sticks and pieces of bark and turtle shells and seashells and anything I can find. And I kind of liken it to when you're a little kid and you're taking a walk and you find a really nice pebble and you pick it up and you put it in your pocket and you take it home. And then of course your mom puts it through the washing machine. Um, but I still do that. Everywhere I go, I'm picking things up. And it's funny when you travel because TSA loves me. They find rocks in my luggage and sticks. And it's like, what are you doing, lady? Um, and I try not to have to explain to them. <laughs> so that's pretty fun, though. But it's just, you know, I work at things in, in different ways. Sometimes I'll pick up an object like, Here's a really nice looking nut. And I'll develop the piece around that particular find. Other times, I will create the sculpture and then figure out what do I have on these shelves that would go in that? Or should I go take a walk in the woods? Um, I do walk in the woods almost daily. Um, but I find things in my backyard too. Uh, interesting things. I pull uh, old gourds and things out of my compost bin. Um, so everywhere I look, there are things. Okay, so I'm gonna move back over here and I'm gonna turn my camera back around so I can look at you. All right, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my processes and how I do this and why I do this. So as you saw, I use these pods in almost all of my work. Um, as I said, it's become kind of ubiquitous in my work. And the reason is that I, that harks back to my travels, especially in Italy. I spent a lot of time in Florence. I would travel there probably at least twice a year, but three, four times a year. And in Italy, they have tabernacles on the corners and on the buildings and everywhere you go. And these are shrines and they're Catholic, of course. Um, but I got to thinking, you know, if I were building a shrine, what would I put in it? Well, it would be nature because that's what I think is important. Um, so the pods kind of came from that, that I was thinking these are like little shrines for me. Um, and not only that, but the shape, is a womb so it's you know the beginning of life it's also a shroud so it's honoring the death of natural things uh, it's both so it's that dichotomy the original shape comes from a milkweed pod um, so i was fascinated with those and when i moved from um, california to ohio the whole world opened up because in Southern California, you don't have trees and you don't have hardwood forests. And all of a sudden, here I am exposed to all these amazing things and we didn't have milkweed. And these pods that are growing all over my yard, like, wow, these are so cool. So I really became fascinated with them. Um, so I make them all the time. And as I said, it's a womb, it's a shroud. Some people say it looks like a boat, you know, so it can be all kinds of things that uh, I'm pretty hung up on that. I want to show you a few pieces. Um, this piece, this is actually ceramic on the outside. So this was a new adventure for me, uh, taking a ceramics class and making these ceramic leaves that I then did the woven pod inside. There's another one. Um, the thing with these is this will be an installation piece as well. And again, it talks about the destruction of the environment. Um, but it's also, it's going to probably be titled Once There Were Trees, um, but it's hopeful too, which is why 
they all have a ginger, a wild ginger seed inside. And ginger seeds, ginger is a medicinal herb, but it also denotes rebirth and a long life. So I want my messages to be hopeful as well as, you know, really talking about destruction of the environment and how we are, are stewards of the environment. Um, you know, once an educator, always an educator. So I, I like to have people kind of stumble upon things. And a lot of the things I showed you on my shelves are dead things that uh, most people would just uh, disregard if they're taking a walk in the forest or they'd kick aside, but I want people to notice that, you know, these forms and these colors are beautiful and we need to recognize that and take care of it. Uh, so I, I, I read a lot about um, eco-psychology and I really believe in that, that uh, we are in a symbiotic relationship with nature, that, we're, that nature is not subservient to man and never should be. And, uh, you know, we, we, it's our duty to really recognize that. And it is very important to our physical health as well as our mental health. So that's part of what I'm trying to do. I'm also, as I said, I like that idea of little kids uh, happening upon things. So I like little surprises um, in my pieces. I also like to take my pieces and I put them places. Uh, I do you put them in the hollow trees and I put them out in the forest and I have um, did a lot of work where I took little sculptures and I mounted them in the tabernacles in Italy and just walked away and left them, uh, which was very hard to do. But uh, I like the idea of somebody just happening upon something interesting and unusual and wondering what it is, what does it mean? Um, so I'm doing that. So these pieces, um, I want to talk a little bit, as I said, about my process. I showed you my big looms. Sometimes I work on a little loom. This is just a little board. Um, again, these are the spacers I put in when I'm weaving. These are all spacers. There's just a little bit of weaving done here. But what will happen is when this comes off the loom, this will be engineered into a 3D piece. So, the, oh, I did want to say, um, this, usually I use linen. This is paper. Uh, so I, I'm making paper threads as well, uh, which is really fun. As I said, I'm a paper maker. So I take strips of paper, which is Kozo, and I spin it. It's cut into strips like this, and I spin it either on my spinning wheel or more often than not, just a hand spindle. And it becomes really, really strong. And at that point I can weave with it. Uh, and I like the idea that I'm taking something that was once plant and making something new out of it that will be sustainable. So at any rate, this is a piece I just cut off the loom. It came off that four harness I was showing you. The blue are the spacers. So what happens is I pull these out and I'm gonna just do one whole side here. As I pull them out, you can see there's an empty space there in the warp thread. I weave really tight. So sometimes these are hard to get out. But once they come out, then I have the opportunity of forming this. That one's really stubborn. As I said, I weave really, really tight. This particular one is linen. Okay, so this is all the warp thread. And this is the weft. And these are where the spacers were. So I simply take that and I pull it. And I take every one in turn and pull it. And that's what causes this to gather up into a 3D shape. So once all of those warp threads are pulled, it looks like this. So this is the beginning of my pod. Um, and again, it's very strong. And each of these warp threads, now I will put on a needle and needle weave them back in. Pretty, my work is pretty tedious. 
I kind of think of it as meditating, but it's pretty tedious. And then I have an edge that I have to finish. So when you look at these, this edge that I do around my pods, that's called coiling, which is a very traditional basketry technique. Um, so what I do, I've got a central core here, which happens to be paper, and I'm tangled up. And then a thread, and this is the most tedious part of my work, is winding this around. So it's wind, wind, take a stitch, wind, wind, take a stitch. And I'm winding while I'm doing it because it's taking so much time. Um, but it gives me the ability to shape this the way I want that will help form it and it becomes very, very strong. Uh, when I'm done with these, you can tap dance on them. Um, it's that strong. But again, this is like meditating, you know, just I'm alone with my thoughts a lot, um, which is a good thing because I plan new projects. And uh, once this is all coiled and the edge is all done, then I figure out how I'm going to put my object in. These particular ones, I'm making these, um, uh, these are, what are they, milkweed pods. Uh, and it's been waxed. So that's what gives it its strength and the nice look to it. So that'll go in. And usually I sew things in. Sometimes I use a little glue. And then I work out how I'm going to um, adhere this to other pods or in a sculpture or how that's going to be. So again, it's all about the environment. I want people to understand how important that is and just make these little discoveries of these little beautiful things and reawaken that sense of wonder. I think that's all I have. Thank you, Shara. That was, that's amazing. Um, you have a beautiful studio. I love seeing all those natural objects in your studio too, and how you Thank use you. them, and, um, and getting a look at your process too. Um, you know, your work looks very, very, I'm gonna say well-crafted, and that's really a big part of it, and, um, and tedious too. And so um, it's satisfying to know that it is in fact tedious because mm -hmm. it looks <laughs> like it requires a lot of time. It does. Yeah, beautiful. So Thank I you. think um, Tony uh, Williams has joined us. Um, did, Tony, did you wanna say anything about the show while you're here or you just wanna keep yourself muted as an observer? I'm not sure I can actually unmute you. So, okay. Yeah, so I think, um, let's go to the Q&A and if Tony can join us, he can jump in there at some point. Do you wanna start the questions, Megan? There, there we go. And then Kelly, I was looking, it looks like, yeah, if you would give a world on muting Tony, he's under panelists as well. So maybe give a whack at that. Um, but hello everyone, I've been collecting questions for these amazing artists. So let's go. Um, first off, we'll try to go in order. Let's start with Jessica. So do, oh good, yes, there's Jessica. So it says outstanding presentation, Jessica. Will you continue to do manipulations of warps and wefts with the digital process, do you think? I know you adjusted slightly. Uh, um, thank you so much for that question. Um, I, yes, I think that um, for me, uh, the manipulation of what can happen from the two-dimensional plane um, on, you know, when the weaving exists after its life on the loom is very exciting, compelling to me. And that's where so much of like the conception of my pieces comes from. And the cool thing about digital weaving, excuse me, um, is that this particular loom that we're getting for Praxis is 
like the same uh, piece of equipment that you would have at a mill. So if you sent out a photograph to be weave it, woven, um, it would automatically weave it like a printer. So it's no human is involved in the weaving of that thing. So this is the same kind of loom, except there's a person and we were sitting, standing in front of it doing the physical weaving. So um, you can have the opportunity to pull threads, to change the warp, to make all these micro decisions as you weave that you can't do in any other way. So this is like this kind of um, magical niche where digital meets analog in this field. And I'm super excited to explore it. So yes, the answer is yes and yay. <laughs> we, uh, we also, uh, I'll do it kind of by artist clusters for this. It just, I think will be easier than bopping around. So I got another one for you, Jessica, which is just talking about in uh, maybe the pieces in the audit thread, the one that we showed, how do you manipulate the warp in those situations? Like in delivery, for example. Great. Um, I wish that I had taken a picture of this insane system that I rigged at the back of my loom, which I realized when the weaving came off the loom, I didn't capture it. But it, in, um, the warp was divided into 12 separate warp bundles that all were different lengths based on how much I wanted to pull them out. And then I hung, I suspended them in the back of the loom from large water bottles because it was the only thing that I had around that I knew could be heavy. Um, it wasn't perfect. I think I, um, there is a million different ways to do it, but basically you just need tension and you need to be able to adjust the length. So you have to have something that can be taken off and taken back on again. So the back of the loom was 12 hanging water bottles. And at the front of the loom, after I managed to pull them out, I forgot in the original planning that they actually need to be reconnected because again, tension re involves being, you know, stuck for, on both the front and the back of the loom. So I had probably 20 industrial clamps um, in the front and the water bottles in the back and it was complete chaos the entire time and um, but also a really exciting challenge and I think I'm excited to play around with different shapes um, and different um, amounts of cascading and pulling and how that can change the process so it was not it was it was a little clumsy but it worked I love that the textile lotus especially is so practical when it comes to process. It's like, that's around, we're going to use it. Just yes. doesn't matter if it's pretty, hell or high water, here right. we go. Right. All so, part of the adventure. It's, it, and that piece is so cool. So thank you, Jessica. I got a couple for Cynthia next. I'll go ahead and unmute you, Cynthia, and do you next. Unmute. It's um, that moment where I narrate my own. So Cynthia, so I have everybody loved your passion, just loved it. And um, one of the first ones that we had was Cynthia, how do you keep yourself inspired? Wow. I know. <laughs> well, um, I, I am just blessed when I work, wake up every day. I, I really take that air in and I really appreciate that we have one more day to get it right. And I really mean that. Um, it just, it's just a wonderful, it, even if some of you do um, um, breathing exercises, you know how it feels when you fill your lungs up and you push out and you, you feel that change and you feel yourself um, uh, being enveloped, then you just push out, you breathe in the air and then you push out whatever is negative or whatever. So um, when I was younger, I did more exercise. I mean, really, <laughs> did, did I even sleep? three or four hours and that was it. Um, but now I need my sleep. Um, but yeah, so I just stay uh, channeled and I say prayed up and, and I have a lot of faith in, and, and I believe, I believe. So yeah, I believe in, in God. So yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it wakes me up every day. It wakes everybody up every day. And in the comment thread, we had a ton of people just in awe of your energy and how inspired you are and your work reflects that. It's so colorful. It's Thank so you. energetic. Thank and you. I wish I, I wish I had now had showed all my stuff. I was like, oh, I have, to have so much stuff. But maybe there'll be a next time somewhere else. Right. And I, actually, love, I love looking at the studios, actually. Yeah. 
Good. And actually, it's a good plug for Cynthia has a program. If you want more, Cynthia, everyone who's listening, it's October. October. Listen to me. Sorry. Yes. August. August 15th, uh, Cynthia will be doing the Legacy of African American Textiles. It's a Saturday and will be 1 to 2.30 on Zoom. So in that presentation, we'll be covered um, not just a very long, beautiful legacy, uh, international artists like Romeo Berdin, Faith Rangold, and also local artists, and Cynthia's yes. own work, Tony's work, who's the curator yes. of the exhibition, obviously, It'd be fabulous. It's, and Mariah Johnson, who's also involved. It'll be amazing. So I got another one for you, Cynthia, uh, Cynthia, that's more process related. It said, Cynthia, do you create all the components to align with your planned artwork or do you create parts and pieces and then decide where to use them? It would be both. both. Uh, so, some, of the, some of the pieces I've collected for years. So um, I, I would say I'm a collector. If, if I see something that resonates in my heart and it makes it makes me warm, makes me feel good. I just grab it. I just have to have it. I don't have to know what I'm going to do with it right then and there. I grab it. So I'm, I would say I'm a collector. That would be the best way to put it. Um, and then sometimes I, I, I literally, well, I sketch. And I really wish I had gone to get some of my sketches to show. I'm a drawer. I draw, I draw everything out. So I think it, and then I start, I mean, I've been sketching through our, through our conversations. I've been sketching. <laughs> So I'm I'm um, constantly I iterating and and um, um, and and um, sketching, which then be becomes patterns because of my um, fashion design background. I make patterns. Um, most quilters don't, but I do. I mean, I I know how to make a pattern, so I know how to make it flip or twist or you know be exaggerated or thin or what have you, concave, convex or what have you. So I actually will make a pattern to to get exactly what I want. Oh. Yeah. That's so, so both of those, what both. they ask, I do a little bit of both. And then, of course, I will, again, I will create a new texture, a, 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 a painting technique, or what have you. Mm -hmm. I, I love doing things that are, discovering things and doing things that are very, very unique and different. Give it a whirl. And uh, just in closing, I have a, it's a comment instead of a question, which is that um, one of the fellow artists in the show said, Cynthia, swing low, sweet cherry of peace is stunning. Simply put, stunning exclamation oh, thank you. point. Thank you. So I wanted to pass it along. There was a thank lot you. of feedback. Yeah, if they, if they check out the video, they'll, there's a piece in there where people, where there's actually singing that happens when they start showing uh, that piece. And, and they we'll, sing, swing low, sweet cherry. So that would be a follow up. Yeah, And we share the link in the comments, but we'll make sure to actually share the link uh, on the website as well so that it's going to be in a more permanent location. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Thank you. Excellent. I got some questions for Ron next. Now, let me go ahead and do that. Gotcha. I think I got Ron. One second. This seems... Ah, perfect. Hi, Ron. Hi. So I know that you um, physically type the answers for this, but I wanted to, if it's okay, ask you as well, just so people will hear it too. Will that be all right? Yeah. Oh, great. So we had a question. So first, which was that, Ron, I am so impressed by the scope and depth of your work. Many artists working on such a global scale projects often have a team of employees or at least volunteers. What kind of personnel structure do you have to help organize all of this? Or are you an incredible one man band? Basically, I'm an incredible one-man band, but I do I do have a board, and each of the board members actually partake in the production, editing. So you know, I do have a small team, but I would like in the future for it to grow. So, so and especially with the the construction of the pieces, that's that's all you though. That's right? all me. Yeah. Yes. That yeah. a lot of work. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. And then um, also, again, with Ron, we did share the link for High Art Fridays, but we can also include that on our website, too, so that people can have access to the glory that is that project. Okay. Um, my next question for you, Ron, uh, is, Ron, do you, and I love this one, love, Ron, do you have plans to show, show these pieces in some kind of alternative fashion show? I'd love to see them on moving bodies. Also, it says, your block collection is incredible incredible hat block collection and then that they want to visit your studio yeah. <laughs> so um, fashion well, show i have done fashion shows in the past with alternative mediums uh, but i had actually planned to do one i think it was in march or april but it was because of the pandemic it was actually postponed so 
things have shifted, but yes, I do. That is one of my goals too. I do love exhibiting my work in, in, fa in a fashion setting on models. So that is something that I would like to do with the, with the plastic pieces as well. And next one is, because I mean, the, I think that's the first thing you see is you see them, you want to just see them move, they're gorgeous. Um, I have a technical one next, which is Ron, what tools do you use to manipulate your plastics when you're working? Um, the main tool that I use to manipulate, shape, mold the plastic is actually a heat gun. Uh, other oh. than that, it's cutting tools, but the heat gun actually really gives sort of a flowing liquid, liquid sort of a shape. And actually, I definitely use a respirator when using the heat gun because plastic is very, very toxic. So I, I do it outside with a respirator on. So. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess that's a great example of that toxicity, why you don't want that flooding the environment. If you're just right. working with it, almost, yeah. you know, impacts your and, health. And I use it minimally. I use the heat gun minimally. So is it mostly hand outside of? Mostly, yes, hand, yes. And that's come to the show for anyone who's with us because the detail on those pieces is insanity. And there's just, there's corseting, there's sewing techniques. It is gorgeous. And that with the paired hats, they they have their own narrative. They interact with each other. It's amazing. And then I have a final question for you, uh, Ron, which is I wanted to know about what kind of shows you have on the horizon and what you have coming up. Uh, well, as I mentioned in the narrative, I have a show opening, uh, two shows, one at Ramp Arts, which is going to be opening in August. Another show at the Halley Building, which is opening in August. And we are doing a series of workshops in the community through Sustainable Cleveland. We're doing a workshop with the Upcycle Shop. Uh, and, and actually in December, we're planning on having a culminating show of all the cap caps that have been created through our workshops and through the international and local artists will be at the, art, at the Art House. Hopefully we're planning that to be in December, but we don't know what format it's going to be virtual, physical, or how that's going to work. We'll definitely keep you keep us posted on it because yeah. I love yeah. to see more of those pieces and I know everyone who's watching would completely want the same so stay tuned both on Rob's you know Ron's personal websites and ours and we'll keep you posted so thanks Ron I'm gonna go ahead and do the last one so we're gonna take it to Char hi Char <laughs> ah there's a Char hi Char hi. So I wanted, so we have a question for you, pull it right off my chat, um, which was that how are, how did you incorporate the plastic bottles into Hang 10 in the, no, I might say the last word, is it Greer? No, it's Hang 10 in the gyre. Di the gyre. Super wrong. Thank you. Yeah, the gyre is that floating island in the ocean of trash. Oh, gross. Okay. So, so um, the plastic bottles, you know, I, I wanted to represent the ocean in the, in the pods and then the plastic bottles are the gyre. Um, so what I did is, again, I used what Ron said. I used a heat gun to melt these uh, bottles down a little bit and just kind of make them stick together. And then with a little bit of glue, <laughs> And I do a lot of sewing. I punch holes and sew them right to the fiber. So uh, again, the idea was because I grew up in the Pacific uh, coast, you know, and it just disturbs me that, I mean, all of this environmental stuff disturbs me. Ron, what you said about the plastics, I'm just, oh my gosh, I can't believe that they're manufacturing it like crazy. And that's one thing I hate about the pandemic is that I can't use my cloth bags and I have all this packaging and it's like, oh my. So everything. Anyway, I'm on my soapbox now. Sorry. No, no, it's good. <laughs> the idea of art is supposed to be social and it's supposed to be political. Yeah. Art, is, art is a perspective and that perspective shouldn't be. Yeah, but back to that piece, you know, it's all beautiful and you know, it's wonderful. And then you look underneath and then there's all this plastic. <laughs> And we had someone commenting on the day, they're like, wow, that plastic is jarring. I'm like, that is inherently the point. Natural yeah. world, gross man-made underpinnings, looking exactly. at beautifulness. So well, that is, that's actually, we had, thanks for all the great questions, guys. I received word from Kelly that we were able to unmute Tony. So I'm gonna throw it back to Mindy. And um, did we wanna have Tony just say a couple of thank yous before we um, close tonight? Yeah, I did. So um, I just want to remind everyone also that um, we have part two of these artist talks on Wednesday, August 26th 
and they'll be featuring Phyllis Brody, Rebecca <sighs> Cross, Mariah Johnson, and Amy Lee. We are considering moving the time of the artist talk so that they start a little bit later, so it's not quite in the dinner hour. We'll probably start at seven on those, so that'll be a change. Um, Tony, would you like to say a few words before we go? I would just like to say thank you to, to the artist. Um, the more I hear your stories, the more I learn about you. I am so elated to have you as a part of this um, art and thread exhibit. Um, it has truly been a pleasure. Uh, I look forward to working with you more in the future. Please come out and see the show. It's an amazing show. Thanks, Tony. And Tony did a great, a, just a fabulous job curating this exhibition. Um, so I, I think that's it. So and does anybody have anything else that they'd like to say, artists, before we sign off? Okay, Rob? Is there going to be a plan uh, platform that the artists can meet in the gallery as, as a collective? I know they talked about that in the beginning. Um, well, uh, we do have a limit of 10 uh, for our gallery space as per social distancing goes, but um, we can certainly talk about that. Um, yeah, sure. I, you know, we've been getting quite a number of visitors during the day. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're almost hitting our limits on some days with the visitors. Um, so the show's, um, the show's doing great. Um, I think we're going to be getting some good publicity. I'm not going to spill the beans on that for the show, but um, I think we'll, we'll be getting some even better publicity than we've gotten to date too. So we'll keep you guys informed on that. So, so definitely, Ron, we'll talk scheduling amongst the artists. We'll figure that guy out. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think we're going to say good night. Um, thank you all for coming. There is a survey that will pop up as you leave this Zoom, and hopefully, please take it. Um, otherwise, we're going to send it to you again, and we're just going to keep hitting you on the head until you take it. The surveys are really important to us. And don't forget, if you've got ideas for other programs, uh, we'd love to hear those, because we like to base our programs on the ideas that the people who watch the programs are feeding back to us. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Tony. Um, thank you, Megan. And thanks, Kelly. It's been a great evening. Thank you, thanks, everyone. Everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Great night. Bye. Bye.